This video is a side quest, a love story, a mystery, and a parable, all rolled into one. It's a story about my favorite little machine, my lathe. She's a 1960s MyFood ML10 lathe, and she was the first copper machine tool I ever bought. She cost me 350 pounds two years ago, and it's one of the main reasons that this rocket journey was possible. She's a solid little lathe, considering she's older than my dad, and she's chomped through steel, aluminium, and copper with me. This lathe was the birthplace of the BEL rocket and the new pin tool, as I've slowly pushed her to do more and more heavy machining. But as much as I love my little Myford, she's starting to show her age and her small stature. Project Santa Maria is going to require precisely machined parts and levels of accuracy my Myford won't be able to handle. It's also going to be bigger, much bigger, which means it's time to get my little Myford a new big sister. Hi. My name's Callum, and this is Project Santa Maria. This all started a few months ago when I realised I needed a bigger lathe for our new combustion chamber. After scouring eBay and a failed trip I dragged Jamie on to Birmingham, a little gem popped up in Worcester and after a bit of work it was pick up day. A lovely man named John agreed to do the delivery for me. From my hometown he was the calmest person I've ever seen moving nearly three tonnes of lathe. Believe me, when this thing started flying, I was pretty scared. John's 12 ton high up though made light work of it. Absolute piece of cake. After wrapping it up in a tarpaulin, we agreed to meet at seven the next morning in the workshop to unload. Unloading the lathe was much the same. John being an absolute professional, put it down on three machine skates and then we were able to push it in through the doors with a bit of help from Archimedes' favourite thing, a lever. So after a little bit of uh, pushing and shoving, we've got it in its final location, up here, next to the mill. Um, I'm so happy, this is awesome, this is looking awesome. Um... After getting it into final position off the skates, next up was the job I relished the least, getting off 24 years of dirt, grease and rust. Here we go. We can start with getting all the protective grease that's been stopping it getting rusty off the bedways and then clean them up with scotch Brite and plenty of WD-40. The coolant nozzles and tool post holder can then get unbolted before being twisted and slid off the carriage, dodging the old coolant as much as you can. The carriage then gets a layer of towels to stoke in some evaporost. Evaporost has been on overnight, so we're going to take it off and hopefully quite a bit of the surface rust, surface rust has come off. The evaporist has done its magic and a few wipes of scotch bright. this thing is looking awesome. That is 10 times better than what it was. We can take a panel out of the rear guard to get to the back of the carriage. This gets a once over and much of the swarf is removed as possible. The swarf tray can then be cleaned up with a wire brush and some soapy water, with the same being done for the coolant tray. Putting these back in place and they look awesome. I really want to make some chips at some point. Oh. With the lathe looking a bit cleaner, it's time to see if this thing will actually turn on, which means getting it wired into the three-phase supply, plugging it in and testing it. Yay! I think I'm going to go have some lunch and then I'm going to come back and do the actual test. Or am I? Or should I just try it now? I might try it. I've tried it. We have power. Nothing's nothing's going weird. Let's try turn the controller on. See what happens. It beeps. The floppies are clicking. It's doing something. I think we've run into our first proper issue, and that is that the controller is just showing me this line. Now, 
What happens from here is still a mystery to me, so let's see what you guys think. Looking at the manual for the control system, and doing the logic cable test as suggested, it stated that the entire control pendant would need replacing. And for 20 year old technology, these things are not cheap. The problem with the screen seems like it's a problem with this entire CNC control pendant. Uh, I've, had the, uh, I've had the back out, I've had a look at the circuit boards, possibly while they were getting stored outside they got wet. This is kind of old tech stuff, so it's a bit more sensitive to moisture. Um, for tonight, I'm gonna to take it inside, get these circuit boards nice and dry, and plug it in again tomorrow and see if that makes any difference. With nothing to lose, I tried a few things myself. Coming back the next morning and putting the circuit boards back into the pendant, I gave it another try. No beeps. Now this might not seem significant, but the beeps told me that the control system was in fact working. And then something even better happened. All right, I don't know what I've done, but we have movement. Oh my word, I have no idea what I've done. As things stand, the screen is definitely buggered, but the control system isn't. And we do have some movement in the lathe. Z axis is working. Our spindle goes. If I do this handle, stools. That is some good news. Firstly, trying to get the screen working. The plug and play LCD replacement screens are extortionately priced. So I found an open source project called RGB to HDMI to convert the RGB signal of the screen to a HDMI output. But as it all turned out, the lathe once again pulled some wizardry. And when I came back to the shed a week later, this happened. You're not gonna bloody believe this. How many times did I try it last time and it didn't work? It's bloody well working. It's flipping working. It's flipping working. I, uh, I don't know what to say. Spindle. Job works. Damn, well, there we go. We've um, solved it. With the screen miraculously solved, I thanked the machining gods and got to work on figuring out the x-axis problems. That's moving. That's moving. After confirming the x-axis servo was working, the problem clearly lurked deeper. This meant a much more hefty teardown. Working in the hole in the back guard of the lathe, I was able to get the servo gear housing, the x-axis bearing, lead screw and gear bout for a clean. These all get cleaned up with WD-40 and scotch bright to get them all smooth again. Though after putting it back together, there was still the same problem. So it's time to go even deeper. I took this opportunity to get the guards off the lathe, meaning I could clean it more thoroughly and wouldn't have to keep working with a tiny hole in the back. Big thanks to Uncle James who helped me off with the bigger bits, which were definitely two men jobs. With the x-axis fully off the lathe, it's clear to see the tersite strips in the bottom are completely ruined at the back. And I have a sneaking suspicion this is what was jamming the axis. Then again, this gets a clean up with the worst of the tersite cut away until I can get it replaced. The ball screw yoke and ball screw nut can then come away, but you'll just have to trust me on that last part. So currently about 50% of the way about taking apart this x-axis lead screw full of all these balls that look like they were in some kind of bearing housing that has just disintegrated over the last 20 years. A bit like, a bit like me, I feel like I've just disintegrated over the last 20 years. Since I was born. I would later realise that generally you should keep the ball screw nut on the ball screw at all times. And the whole nut acts as one big bearing with the smaller bearings inside. But because I'd taken it off, I had to put it back on, which eventually I did. 
After another clean of the surfaces and the much cleaner ball screw yoke can get put back onto the carriage and the ball screw put back in the yoke. And I couldn't forget the final lubing up. Now, because I'm not particularly hench and James wasn't there any longer, I got a trolley to get the carriage back to the lathe and it slid on really well. That is on. And then it's time to put the rest of the axis back together. Everything gets a good helping of WD-40 and some elbow grease. I also decided to replace the horrible angular contact bearings for the ball screw with some nice shiny new ones. These get lubed up and put in back to back to allow for axial loads in both directions. Finally, the face plate and bushings are bolted on and then a final lubing up before the parts go back on the lathe. And now, because I've done this part about four times, this went rather smoothly. And then all that's left to do is... Testing. Now, this thing is a beast. I can put my whole body weight on it and it doesn't even miss a beat. Now it's all smooth, I can get the gibbs back in and adjust it. Moving the carriage bit by bit to get them tight against the bedways. But now I hear you asking, how much bigger is it really though? Okay. Carbide insert chisel. It's like family. It's a little bit chucks. Fuck me. New D11 Camelot for your chuck. I can put my old chuck in it. So there's your answer. Much bigger. Which poses a bit of a problem because my current chuck keys are not made for this level of hardware. This means we're going to have to make some new ones, which means a detour into CAD mode to make the drawings. Onshape is my favourite CAD software. It has all the features you could possibly need and more. Professional grade user interface makes it so easy to make parts, assemblies and get engineering drawings. I use it all the time to give dimensions for parts that would otherwise need me to do maths. And this makes manufacturing so much easier. Great thing is, it's cloud-based. So I can share rocket ideas with Tom or design a whole plane with six other students, sharing it with the lecturers whenever I want. But even with great CAD, things don't always go right. Being fully cloud-based means Onshape can be a full CAD system on your phone. Great for when you need to check your designs in the field. And the best thing about it is it's completely free to sign up. So go check out the link in the bio and support on shape at Support Project Santa Maria. Now it's finally time to make some chips. Both bits of stock get put into the mill and faced off. I can then get the DRO zeroed, spindle and safety specs on, and start taking the cuts to turn these into chuck keys. Now these parts don't need to be particularly accurate, so I'm not holding very high tolerances. I did buy some square ER40 collet chuck holders I was hoping to have them with me to be able to do this, but they never arrived. So I had to square up the old fashioned way. I do think they came out looking pretty sexy though. Next is the pilot hole and, oh, balls. Finishing drilling the holes for the handles. But now these will be some M10 bar with cap head bolts, which I know are super ugly, but I'll make sure to make some nicer ones when the lathe's up and running. Now, we're getting really close to making some cuts. The tool post that you saw come off what must feel like five hours ago now. It's a final clean up before it being slid onto the carriage and bolted back down. Bed beast that provides the ways for the first 300ml of the bed and come out of its evaporust bar and carefully be put back on the bed. Oh. 
Now this should have really been put in with socket head bolts, but I didn't have any of those. So M12 hex heads will have to do for now. A little light adjustment later and she's all lined up. Next, the beautiful three chore chuck gets put into place on the D11 cam lock spindle. I've never used a cam lock system before, but with the new keys, it was a hundred times more satisfying than the threaded chucks on my MyFood. And finally, our humongous new tools can get put into the tool holders and in the tool post, and we are finally, finally ready to go. Okay, it's a new day. We've got everything on the lathe. She's finally in good condition. And I think it's about time we get some steel on there and see if we can make our first chips. Let's give it a go. We're running. Spindle speed. 50 RPM. And forwards. High range. Spindle speed. 500. Forward. Awesome. After getting a bit of oil in the spindle bearings, we can load up a bit of 50mm mild steel into the chuck. This is the biggest bit of stock my other lathe could take. So let's see how this bad girl is. Safety specs on. You stop off. Power on. Spindle speed. 500. Set. Wow, we have some power here, okay. We can now set up and zero our DRO to take some surface cuts. Let's try cuts. Now this seemed to be getting way too hot with a pretty poor surface finish. It also managed to pull the stock out of the chuck, so something was a bit off. You can see that the chisel seems to be digging into the stock, which is why we're getting this almost thread-like pattern on the surface. On the facing pass, it's clear to see why. The tool is about 10 mil above the center line. So luckily, this was just my fault, not the lathes. After a bit of tool height adjustment, I think that's looking pretty good. We now have a working massive lathe. Let's make some more chips. This thing cuts so much better now, and with a few spring passes, even with this large radius insert, the surface finish looks really good. Going for the DRO, that should be a 35 mm block. 30A saying 35.4. Digital calipers are saying 34.94. So, I mean, it's pretty damn good. One of the best parts that has this function. Set a go to limit. I've set it to minus 29 of the Z. So I'll try and go past it. It just stops me. Which means you never overshoot your mark. Now, a few more things about this lathe. It tops out at 2500 RPM, where my old MyFood couldn't go above 900 and it can go as slow as 15 RPM in low range. I was able to take one millimeter cuts into this material, which is five times more than I've been able to do before. And honestly, with the chips flying, I could have stood here and done this for hours. Now, it clearly doesn't have a cross slide, but that doesn't matter because the track software allows you to set the desired angle or radius, and it will automatically cut a taper or a chamfer to that degree. It's also got functions to do threading, boring, drilling, and so many other things I can't wait to test out and show you. So what did I decide to do with all this technical brilliance? Yeah, it's the world's worst spinning top. I probably could have been a bit more creative. Now, if you can remember back to the start of this video, you're probably wondering what happened to that pretty bit of stainless I turned. Well, that got tapped and put in pride of place on the tailstock locking handle. Was this necessary? Absolutely not. But it does make me feel really happy knowing that my MyFood has made this massive lathe a bit more at home in the workshop. Now every time I use this tailstock, I'll remember, 
I came from the tiniest of lanes to this monster and how much further we can go with this project. Beautiful. Now this thing is awesome. It's not perfect. We still need a drill chuck, probably put some coolant in it because when it takes these massive cuts, it gets hot. But all in all, this thing is awesome. I'm really happy. I'm sure you'll see this thing a little bit more in the next few videos. Building the combustion chamber, the maths behind the combustion chamber. I don't want this to become a machining channel, although I am in love with machining. This is a rocket channel where we learn machining at the same time. What I'm now going to call my little machine shop. Camera, focus, which is crazy. See you tomorrow.